Now on BBC Radio 4 FM, it's time for the final episode of our Book of the Week, Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes. Daniel Everett's account of living with a tribe so remote that he was the first linguist to understand their unusual language. He went first as a missionary, but as you'll hear in today's episode, Daniel's faith was shattered. My investigations into Piraha culture required spending long periods of time among them. Our longest visit was in 1980, when my family and I spent almost the entire year in the village. At the beginning of this period, I saw that the palm-thatched roof of our large hut needed to be replaced. It was in bad shape because while we were away from the village, the Piraha liked to sleep in the loft. They enjoy stargazing, so they push holes in the thatch, ruining the roof. This problem turned out to be the beginning of my entry into the real world of the Pirahas, the jungle. Here I would come to see them as one of the most resourceful and clever groups of survivalists anywhere in the world. I hooked two full one-quart military surplus canteens to my military gun belt, as well as a long Mexican Acapulco machete. The five Piraha men, carrying nothing but one axe and a few machetes among them, laughed at my long sleeves, long pants, boots, hat, canteens, and enormous machete. By working and sweating together, laughing at our own difficulties and errors, the Pirahas and I cemented friendships through such jungle trips. I never lost sight of the fact that I was being paid by my missionary company to translate the Bible into the Piraha language. The Summer Institute of Linguists believes that the most effective way to evangelize indigenous peoples is to translate the New Testament into their language. In my free time, I would also talk to people about my faith and why it was important to me. In the evening, after my family had finished dinner, when we were still cool from our baths in the Mysi River, we would make coffee for some of the villagers who visited. Because the Pirahas had no word for God, I used the term Maihi Hioya, which means High Up Father. I said that our High Up Father had made my life better. He had come into my heart and made me happy. Ko'oi asked me once, What else does your God do? I told him, Well, he made the stars and he made the earth. Then I asked, what do the Piraha say? He answered, Well, the Pirahas say that these things were not made. So I would go further and ask questions like, Who made the Mysi River? Where did the Pirahas come from? But I soon began to realize that they had no creation myth or traditional story. The Pirahas don't talk about the distant future or the distant past. They don't talk about unexperienced events or fictional topics. They live only for the present. One night I decided to tell them something very personal about myself, that my stepmother committed suicide, and that this had led me to Jesus. The Pirahas burst into laughter. This was unexpected, to put it mildly. Why are you laughing? I asked. She killed herself. Ha ha ha! How stupid! Pirahas don't kill themselves, they answered. They were utterly unimpressed. The fact that someone I'd loved had committed suicide was no reason at all for the Pirahas to believe in my God. Indeed, it had the opposite effect. The Piraha men then asked, Hey Dan, what does Jesus look like? Is he dark like us, or light like you? Well, I said, I've never actually seen him. He lived a long time ago but I do have his words. Well, Dan, how do you have his words if you have never heard him or seen him? They then made it clear that if I had not actually seen this guy, they weren't interested in any stories about him. This is because the Pirahas believe only what they see. What a setback for my missionary objectives. It made me think long and hard about my purpose among the Pirahas. Yes, I
One morning, I was sitting in the front room of our house, drinking coffee with several Piraha men, and Ko'oi came in. Hey, Dan, I want to talk to you, he demanded. The Pirahas know that you left your own land. We know that you do this to tell us about Jesus. You want us to live like Americans. But the Pirahas do not want to live like Americans. We like to drink. We like more than one woman. But we like you. You can stay with us. But we don't want to hear any more about Jesus. Okay? The other men present seemed to agree with him. So I replied, if you don't want Jesus, you don't want us. You don't want us. I needed to get on with my studying. So the men rose and left to go fishing. This shocked me, and this information presented me with a clear moral choice. I had gone to the Pirahas to tell them about Jesus, and to give them an opportunity to choose joy and faith over despair and fear, to choose heaven over hell. I talked this over with my wife Karen. We decided that before we made any decision, we would take our first trip back to the United States in over five years. And I thought hard about the challenge of my missionary work. I was trying to convince a happy, satisfied people that they were lost and needed Jesus as their personal Savior. On our return, we decided to move to another village. We had something new to offer this group of Pirahas the recently translated Gospel of Mark in Piraha, recorded in my own voice. I brought in a wind-up tape recorder and taught the Pirahas how to use it. A few weeks later, the people were still listening to the Gospel, with children cranking the recorder. I was initially quite excited about this, until it became clear that the only part of the book they paid attention to was the beheading of John the Baptist. Wow, they cut off his head! Play that again. It was becoming clear that the message I had staked my life and career on did not fit the Pirahas culture. They didn't feel lost, so they didn't feel a need to be saved either. They are firmly committed to the pragmatic concept of utility. Surprisingly, all this resonated with me. The Pirahas rejection of the gospel caused me to question my own faith. There was so much about the Pirahas that I admired, their quality of inner life, their happiness, their contentment. The Pirahas have built their culture around what is useful to their survival. My faith seemed a glaring irrelevancy in this culture. It was superstition to the Pirahas, and it began to seem more and more like superstition to me. I began seriously to question the nature of faith, of believing in something unseen. Sometime in the late 1980s I came to admit to myself that I no longer believed in any article of faith, or in anything supernatural. I was a closet atheist. I was not proud of it, and I feared the consequences. It took twenty years for me to reach the place where I was finally prepared to take the consequences of my deconversion, and as I expected, when I finally announced my change of belief, it had severe consequences for me personally. It's such a difficult decision for anyone to tell his closest friends and family that he no longer shares their foundational beliefs. In the end, my loss of religion and the epistemological crisis that accompanied it led to the breakup of my family, the one thing I had most wanted to avoid. I went to the Pirahas when I was 26 years old. Now I'm old enough to receive senior discounts. I gave them my youth. Now my grandchildren all know the Pirahas and my children are who they are in part because of them. The Pirahas have shown me that there's dignity and deep satisfaction in facing life and death without the comfort of heaven or the fear of hell, and in sailing toward the great abyss with a smile. And they've shown me that for years 
I held many of my beliefs without warrant. I've learned these things from the Pirahas, and I will be grateful to them as long as I live. <laughs> Colin Stinton was reading Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes by Daniel A.